thank you for the opportunity to just glory in your glory. Thank you for the privilege of it. Granted, that's all that we need to just come and worship you one more time. We pray that you will anoint your word and touch your hearers and touch the minds and spirits of people everywhere as they pause to hear your word. And bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I made another change today in the scripture and the lesson. I was thinking about Martin Luther King Jr. All right. So we're going to focus our attention to the book of Genesis, chapter 37. Now on the board, you see 37, 5 through 10, and also 37, 18 through 20. Amen? I will be reading from the New Living Translation, Genesis 37. And if you would join me by honoring God by standing, if you're able, I will commence reading with verse 5. One night, Joseph had a dream. Somebody say, had a dream. Had a dream. When he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. Listen to this dream, he said. We were out in the field tying up bundles of grain. Suddenly, my bundle stood up, and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. His brothers respond, so you think you will be king, do you? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams and the way he talked about them. Verse 9, so soon Joseph had another dream. Somebody say, had a dream. <laughs> And again, he told his brothers about it. Listen, I have had another dream, he said. The sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed low below me. This time, he told the dream to his father as well as to his brothers. But his father scolded him. What kind of dream is this, he asked. Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow to the ground before you? Turn now to 37 over to the 18th verse. When Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they recognized him in the distance. As he approached, they made plans to kill him. Here comes the dreamer, they said. Come on, let's kill him, throw him into some citron or pit. We can tell our father a wild animal eating him. And then we'll see what will become of his dreams. One other translation put it like this. Come let us kill the dreamer and then we will see what will become of his dreams. My subject for you today, keep dreaming. Keep drinking. Keep drinking. In the Old Testament, the Lord used different kinds of dreams to reveal information, reveal information, and to direct his prophets in what to say and where to go into certain directions. 
We read in the book of Job at the 14th chapter, 7th chapter, 14th verse. And Job was having a lot of troubles in his life. And to make things worse, he speaks of some shattering and terrifying dreams. Have you ever had a dream you just wish you could wake up? <laughs> Job had that kind of dream. And in Ecclesiastes 53, it says, too much activity yields to restless dreams. And the Bible is talking about ordinary dreams. Some of them are shattering. And some things we just so busy about these, we take it to sleep with us. And we dream about it. And then another scripture says that the prophets among you, the Lord says, I will reveal myself to them. How will you do this, Lord? I will reveal myself to them in visions, and I will speak to them in dreams. So the Lord speaks to us in our dreams. He spoke to his prophets. God uses his, his power to communicate to us in different ways. And one of those is in dreams. An angel appeared to Joseph in a dream to warn him that Herod was plotting to kill Jesus. To the Solomon, the Lord appeared when he was in a position of just becoming the new king. And he asked him in a dream, what is it that you want for your new position? Many of us are familiar with the story of that Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel. And the Lord troubled the king with dreams. So dreams are a part of our spiritual existence. If we go to sleep and the Lord communicate to us for different reasons in dreams. Here in our text, Joseph, he received two dreams. And these dreams, as we heard, they troubled his family, made them mad. His brothers were angry at him. His father scolded him. In Genesis 37, 60, he told his brothers about his dream. He said, listen, yeah, we were out one day and we all were doing our normal chores. We were bundling the grain. Then all of a sudden, mine stood up over yours. Mine was much taller than the rest of yours. Now these brothers didn't like him anyway. And the reason they didn't like him because he was his father's favorite son. Remember that coat of many colors? Remember how his father just, so they didn't like him anyway. He, he come with a dream, literally telling them that he is better than they are. And that they are going to bow down to him. Now he's 17 years old. He's the second youngest of his father's 12 children. Benjamin being the youngest. Benjamin and Joseph was born to Jacob to, by Rachel, the one he loved. So these two children he loved very much, especially Joseph. So now Joseph is telling these brothers he's going to be better. And then the Lord comes with another dream. And the sun representing his father, the moon representing his mother, and the 11 stars representing each one of his brothers. He himself making 12. But all the moon, the stars, and the sun, all going to bow down to him. Now, Daddy said, what's wrong with you, boy? <laughs> you lost your mind? You coming up here telling me that I raised you, and one day I'm going to bow down to you and your mother, too, and all your brothers? What is wrong with you? Maybe he began to think, maybe I spoil this boy too much. You got to be careful. 
but we can inject in our children to make them think they are better. Feel them the same. Amen. Wish my mother had heard that because she used that bell a little harder on me. When God gives you a big dream, do not expect everyone to be excited or happy about what God tells you in your dream. Do not expect that. People have a tendency to be jealous a lot of times about what even God bless you with. Your dream from God, however, should not be discouraged because of what someone else thinks. Because that is God using you. He put you here for a special purpose and a special reason. And if he wants to elevate you to a certain level, and then you are just recipients of the blessing that God has bestowed upon you. Here's another thing that you should be warned of. Do not put self-limitations upon the dreams that you receive from God. Amen. Let me pass that by you one time. If God tells you that you are great, you're going to be great, he's going to elevate you to a straight level, don't tell him that I can't do it. Nobody in my family has ever done anything like that before. Don't put self-limitations upon yourself based on what God has told you he's going to do with you. God can do anything with anybody, anywhere, at any time. You don't have to be what your family has been. When God gets ready to use you, he can take you and your family to a whole new level by just using you. So don't put any limitations on God. When God gives you a dream, another thing that you must remember, that you are the dreamer and not the dream. You are the dreamer and not the dream. Sometimes your dream will rise to a height greater than you are. Sometimes your dream will outlive you. And sometimes your dream will be so large and big in the sight of others that they will be threatened by what you're going to become as a result of your dream. But that's the dream that God has given you. Tomorrow, America will pause to celebrate the life of her greatest dreamer that God has ever given this country. And I heard on the radio that this is the first time that all 50 states in the Union will be honoring this birthday. by parents who instilled in him the great moral principles from the Word of God. They undergirded his life in every aspect of what God was going to utilize him for. His parents told him and taught him to do right because doing right is right. Doing right is the right thing to do. Dr. King was taught that he should treat all people, regardless of race, regardless of gender or nationality, all people with respect. And that's something that we still need in our society today. Dr. King learned at an early age to see beyond the blinding sin of racism. Martin Luther King's best friend, when he was a child, was a white boy. They played together. They enjoyed each other's company. They did all of the things that young kids did together, playing. 
And when they reached the age that it was time to go to school, they could not go to the same school, although they lived in the same neighborhood. After the first day of school, Martin Luther King and his friend never played together again. This early introduction to the sin, sick disease of racism was a demonic act that Satan used for evil. Somebody say, for evil. for evil. But God would use Dr. King's early introduction to racism for a greater good. There are some things that you go through and you can't see all the way down the line. But God is training you for a greater good. And this introduction to this sick disease <laughs> that is a cancer in our society known as racism was introduced to Dr. Martin Luther King at a very early age. God was using Dr. King's exposure to the sinful disease of racism to plant within him a dream that is still electrifying the conscience of the world. People are still wrestling with this dream. Coming somehow to grips with the words and measuring themselves by the eloquence. Trying to grapple, where do I fit in the midst of it? How can we employ it in our lives, in our schools, in our children? And yes, in our churches. Yes, in all of our churches, even those that fall within the category of what I'm about to say. 11 o'clock on Sunday is the most segregated hour yes, in America. Yes. And we're all supposed to be worshiping the same God. Even in all of our churches, they would get together and they would talk about Martin's dream and celebrate it and then for one day, the other 364 days of the year, they won't even call his name. But God had a greater purpose in mind. In the midst of the state of Georgia's racism, God kept a dream growing and festering within him. Dr. King's spiritual character and God-given dream would serve as a model for many who would come and use his example to exist in our racist society. Sports figures like LeBron James, Michael Jordan, Jim Brown would keep dreaming because of Dr. King's dream. Entertainers like Oprah Winfrey, Angela Baskins, Stella by the name of Barack Obama, and many others would come, come, anchor themselves somewhere near the dream of Dr. Martin Luther King. Politicians like Elijah Cummings, Barbara Jordan, they would all come somewhere in the midst of their election and in the midst of their service, they reflected upon the dream of Dr. Martin Luther so I say to you, I say to all of you, keep dreaming. And when life, when life deals you as great as it's low, keep on dreaming. When you find yourself in a well like Joseph, keep on dreaming. When you find yourself hanging on to the edge of life by a rope, just tie a loop, put your arms, and hang on in there. When you find yourself being faced with stones in every way, take them and make yourself some stepping stones. And keep on dreaming. Keep dreaming. In our scripture lesson today, the life of Joseph teaches us to keep on dreaming through it all. Joseph's brother, as you heard in the text, hated him. And he would suffer so much because of that hate. 
They were angry with him. They were angry with him. Yeah. Their anger led them to the point that they even plotted to kill him. Think about that. Your family plotting to kill you because of a dream that God has given you. They were so angry that they took him and they threw him in a pit, in a whale. And thank God that sometimes when people treat you bad, at least somebody around you have a heart. Older brother Reuben said, wait a minute, let's not kill him. Let's just put him in the well. And he had in his mind that after everything was settled down, he was going to come back at night and rescue him and pull him out. Let me tell you something. I don't care what people try to do you, do to you, if God is with you. They can only try to do it. But they have a plan, but thank God he has a master plan. The Reuben's master plan was to show up at night, pull his young brother out of the well. However, before he was able to come, his other brothers, they saw some Ishmaelites, traitors, on their way to Egypt coming. And they decided, well, wait a minute, let's make a little money off of this deal. They decided to make 30, 20 pieces of silver. So they pulled him up out of the well and they sold him into slavery, into bondage to the Ishmaelites. And they took him all down to Egypt. All this is taking place over hatred, over jealousy, over a dream. He goes into Egypt and they sell him to a guard. This happened to be a guard who is over Pharaoh's guards. And his name is Potiphar. They sold him to Potiphar. And there he is, a slave in Egypt belonging to a guard, Potiphar. And then, lo and behold, here he is, nice, dark, and handsome. when I was growing up, my father left me. Only thing that I would ever hear about him, everybody would talk about, what a good looking father I never seen. What a good looking man your father is. They kept on telling me that over and over and over. I would always hear that. Your father was so good looking. Some people, when I say that, they ask me, well, what did he look like? I tell them that I have to go far too far. <laughs> But the baker, he told him, you're going to be released too. 
But in three days, you're going to be executed. Some things you don't want to know. But God was using this connection that Joseph had with dreams for a greater purpose. Because later on, guess who else had a dream? As a matter of fact, he had two. And they began to trouble him. And that was Pharaoh. Pharaoh's dream troubled him so much he was looking for somebody to interpret the dream. And the cup battle, he remembers Joseph in prison. We know this fellow who's in prison. And he interpreted our dream. And exactly what he said was going to happen, happened. So Pharaoh sends for Joseph. And he tells him about his dreams. He says that I saw this thin cow come and he ate up all of my fat cows. Hmm. What does that mean? And then I saw this thin head of grain come and devour all of my healthy grain. Now there were seven fat cows eaten up by this thin cow. Right. There were seven healthy bundles of grain eaten up by this one. What did it mean? Uh, Joseph told him, he said, this is what it means. You have an abundance of wealth like your fat cows <coughs> and your large bundles of grain. But a famine is going to come in your country and it's going to last for seven years. And it's going to devour all of your grains, all of your cattle, and everything. So Pharaoh said, well, what do we need to do? He said, well, put me in charge. <laughs> they put him in charge, and he built granaries. He began to store all of the grains. And Egypt became so rich that they had other countries coming to them. And literally, during that cycle of seven years, they purchased just about all of the wealth of the surrounding countries. And guess what? His family, who was living not too far from there, they were going through the famine also. And they needed something, and Daddy sent some of those boys down there to get some grain from Joseph. They arrived, and Joseph recognized them. But they didn't recognize Joseph. And Joseph gave them what they needed and had them to go, and he planted something on them, gave them all their money back. And when they got home, they saw that they had the money and the grain. But they needed to come back, and they were so scared, so they brought the extra money back. And this time, Joseph said, since you have done this, how's your dad? <laughs> Do you have any other brothers? He said, yeah, we have one young brother named Benjamin. And Benjamin is home and daddy loves him very much. Well, when you come back, I want you to bring Benjamin. And if you don't bring Benjamin, I don't ever want to see you here again. Now I'm in charge down there. So he went and he told his daddy, and reluctantly, Jacob allowed Benjamin to come back. And then when they got down there, he asked again about his father and all of that. And an occasion took place. He was so tearful to see his brothers. And Reuben, the one that, Reuben, the one that had planned to get him out of the well, he told them, we're going through all of this because of what we did to our younger brother. Joseph heard it. He went out of the room and he started crying. He was weeping. And as they were getting ready to go back, he couldn't take it anymore. He called them together. He said, I am your brother Joseph. Somebody say, I'm your brother. And I want you to go back. And I want you to get mama. I want you to get daddy. I want you to bring back everything. And I got some land over here in Goshen. And I'm going to put you all over there. And from now on, you don't have to worry about anything. And if you want anything, all you got to do is call my name. And it'll come to you. Praise God. It'll come to you. 
And they brought daddy and daddy who had been suffering because of the loss of his. He just rejoiced over what had happened. And as they came in, Joseph had told them that one day, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars were going to all come down and bow down to me. And then
that we have come to our nation's capital to cash a check. And we refuse to believe that the banks of this nation are bankrupt. So we have come to collect on this defaulted promissory note. He realized that the ultimate plight of our people would be connected to our ability to rise above poverty in the midst of a vast, wealthy, prosperity nation. And we need to ingrate that in our thinking today. We need to incorporate it in our religious experience, teach our children not to be sitting at the bottom of time, but to rise up in own businesses, rise up entrepreneurs. Rise up and stop thinking I need a good job and go out and make a good job for somebody else. Rise up. Keep dreaming. Have high dreams. Rise up. Stop thinking that there's something wrong with being wealthy. No, God's prophets were wealthy. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and even Joseph down here in Egypt became one of the most wealthiest men in the country. Rise up with your dreams and succeed. When he finally came to the content of his dreams to share with them, he quoted some familiar words. I have a dream that the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that my four little children will one day be judged by the content of their character and not by the color of their skin. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted. Every mountain shall be made low. Every rough place will be made smooth. Every cricket place will be made straight. And the glory, somebody say the glory. The glory. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed to all flesh. Tell somebody, keep dreaming. Keep dreaming. Because God is not finished with us. God has something else to do. God is still working this whole nation to a new height and to a new glory. In conclusion, let me share something with you. On the night that President Barack Obama took the office as President of the United States, he had been elected, he quoted the dreamer, Martin Luther King Jr. Do you remember? He said that I may not get there with you, but I want you to know that we as a people will get to the promised land. We shall overcome one day. Keep dreaming. And God's people all said, Amen. God bless you. Maybe there's someone here today, God. I want you to be here. Maybe your dreams have been shattered.